welcome to the security token offering panel, uh, which is uh, been put together by DLA Piper as part of uh, our, our uh, participation in the Hong Kong Blockchain Week uh, and sponsorship of this event. It's great to be here and to be joined by some of uh, some of the people we've been working with to help try and make this ecosystem uh, a reality. This is a follow on to the plenary session we had where we talked about the, the launch of the DLA Piper TOCO um, uh, digital asset creation and management platform um, and um, how we're, we're now going to use this panel to explore uh, what's happening in the ecosystem, where we're at to date in terms of the journey so far around the, around the creation of digital assets, uh, the manner in which this uh, marketplace is evolving on a multinational basis, but with particular focus here in Hong Kong, given this is indeed Hong Kong Blockchain Week. Uh, I'm really pleased today to be joined by my partner and head of the real estate uh, group and office managing partner here in Hong Kong, Sashila Rivers. Uh, also joined by Gary Chu, who's the executive director at BC Group. Um, and fantastic to see the news recently, uh, Gary, about the in-principle announcements uh, for your licensing uh, uh, position in Hong Kong. So it's great to see that evolution happening. Uh, John Macy, who from uh, Macy's Auction House, who is here to talk particularly about the opportunities um, around fine art and tokenization and fractionalization of, of, real, of, uh, of, of art. And so Sheila will give the counter opposing view in terms of real estate as a, as a different asset class. And Mance Harmon, um, who is a uh, long-term uh, uh, friend of the firm and uh, the CEO of Hedera Hashgraph, which, uh, which is a fantastic next generation blockchain platform that DLA Piper has been working, uh, working with for a number of years now. So I think the focus today is to look at where we're at, what's happening, and more importantly, what the opportunity is around this fascinating space in terms of the creation of digital assets, the fractionalization and the creation of secondary markets around that. I'm going to uh, start out with a question to Gary, if I may, and it's really around, you know, in your position as a, um, as, as a leader in the Hong Kong space in terms of getting yourself set up with the SFC and, and, and ready to actually participate as being one of the the primary regulated entities that's going to be making this happen. What do you see as the as, as the future, and particularly what, what sort of projects are you seeing either in the pipeline or coming down uh, in the near future? Thanks, Scott. So um, I, I think when we when we sort of broadly talk about STOs as a phenomenon uh, and, and also as a uh, um, as a or, well, I guess as a discussion point, probably we should we should sort of first get get to sort of uh, you know get some get a few definitional questions out of the way. So commonly when we talk about STOs, we're, we're, you know, we're really talking about potentially some financial instruments or some, some kind of financial products being tokenized. So, so on the one hand, we've got sort of this idea of tokenizing financial products versus sort of an, another sort of common, uh, 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 common usage, which is sort of you know, tokens almost as if they were uh, in themselves financial products. And, and, I, and personally, I would say for, you know, for our discussion today, the latter is probably not as meaningful because we are really talking about potentially a very broad universe of financial products that can potentially um, that, that can potentially sort of uh, you know be, become be, become a tradable phenomenon through through technology and through you know through this new medium that that, that we're all working on. So um, you know to, to get back to your question, sort of what, what do we want to see in the sort of short to medium term? Um, I would say, for, you know, firstly, you know, STOs as a potentially as a as a form of um, uh, issuing financial instruments or products um, is something that uh, you know, the, at least theoretically, potentially can be great for issuers, can also be great for investors. But I think, given we are still in a very very early phase um, or, or very sort of uh, you know very very early stage of seeing STOs becoming a thing in capital markets, I think you know, a good STO or great STOs in the short term would be things that are actually, you know, first of all, have to be good for issuers, but at the same time, they have to be good for the investors who buy them, potentially buying them for the first time. So I think the way I would, I would sort of sum it up in the short term is boring is good. Um, you know, this may not be necessarily something we, we like to hear as technologists, as lawyers, as as product structures, but this is something that I would advocate for product issuers in the short term. You know, assets and products which the investors are used to um, in the traditional capital markets universe 
is, is what will get them onto a new medium. And once this medium becomes a little bit more thoroughly understood in the market by all the parties involved, by, by all the different uh, people involved in the ecosystem, then absolutely bring it on in the longer term. But in the short term, probably boring as good is, is, is what I, I would probably advocate. Thanks, Gary. It's uh, we've had that conversation before. I, you know, you know, I'm I'm already dreaming about the the more future state. So I had an interesting conversation with one of my partners overnight about distressed assets, which are obviously a uh, there's there's quite a lot in the current economic environment and, and and the use of distressed assets as a and tokenization as a means for, for refinancing them. So be interesting to see how it plays out. But your uh, point's well made in terms of. Um, what, what, what's gone before, but now in a digital form is probably going to be easier than too much of the, the blue sky thinking. Mance, if I can come to you, and uh, as you know, I'm a, a long-term fan of uh, Hedera um, and the technology. It's the reason the DLA Pipe has joined your governing council. It's the reason I have the privilege of sitting on your uh, board of managers. Um, uh, really interested to get your sense and, and, and input on a combination of not only the Hedera consensus service, but also the token service and the way you think that that's going to be pivotal in in, in supporting the development of this ecosystem. Well, sure, thank you, uh, Scott. So uh, what we, for, for the audience, let me just describe, Hedera is a global public network that has uh, a governing council of some of the largest companies in the world, including DLA Piper as a representative. And we enable tokenization. We're at the bottom of the tech stack, if you wanna think of it in those terms. And we enable tokenization in a couple of different ways. One is the Hedera token service, as Scott alluded to. The Hedera token service, you can think of as sort of the equivalent, enabling the equivalent of an ERC-20 on Ethereum, except it's native to the token service. So there's no smart contracts involved. And it makes it very easy to just quickly spin up a token, if you will, in, in you know, 10 minutes time and have that token available. Uh, because it's not contract-based, smart contract-based, it's native to the platform, it's incredibly efficient and performant, it's uh, very inexpensive to, to execute these, uh, the, the use of this token service. And it's got support for regulatory compliance and KYC and those kinds of things. So we are enabling the, uh, the creation of tokens that are all very similar in nature and function, like an ERC-20 might on Ethereum. In addition to that, what we have is the Hedera consensus service, which is effectively blockchain as a service. In our case, it's Hashgraph, not blockchain. But all it does is it makes it possible for other networks, other platforms, to use our consensus service to put transactions into a consensus order. In the context of tokens, what that means is you can have a private network with all the benefits of a private network in terms of privacy, of course, security, scalability, cost structure, et cetera, that is the ledger for the token, runs the ledger for the token, and it can be distributed. And it uses this public network, the Hedera network, for putting transactions into order. And so you, you have the best of both worlds, a choice between cookie cutter tokens um, or a fully customized token that can operate in any way that you can imagine to design it, running it in a private network, but with consensus being handled by this global public network, providing the decentralized and distributed trust that is the value prop of blockchain in general, and in our case, Hashgraph in specific. Uh, thanks, thanks, man. So it's certainly the you know when we looked at the the legal structuring of security token offerings in our in our Toco platform, it was you know it, it was essential that we solve some of those problems and the combination, particularly you know the consensus service solves a number of the issues that we saw with the existing. Uh, blockchain platforms once we move into into the real world of security tokens uh, and so the ability to have you know fair and you know objectively determinable time stamping the ability to have finality in the transactions these are all you know the ability for the network to have the scalability that we didn't have things slowing down um, or, or impact on the transaction costs as networks get busy which is things we're seeing with some of the other platforms 
So, you know, it really, it, it, it's, it's a fantastic solution um, that, that we've obviously embedded into the, the core of our TOCO platform uh, for, uh, for that public trust layer and all of the transactional support that, that is gonna be essential to making sure that this is a successful ecosystem. Um, Jonathan, if I can talk to you and uh, what a fine uh, picture of a horse in a field of tulips you have behind you, which has uh, been the subject of our recent uh, um, test case for our TOCO, Toco engine. Um, you know, I, I think it'd be great to hear from you. You know, art is an interesting um, use case, an interesting asset category. It's, it's, it's pretty unique in some respects. Um, some of it can be very, very expensive and therefore hard for people to access. So there's potentially opportunities around, um, you know, a fractionalization to it to an, uh, allow more participation. It's potentially there are liquidity issues. But I'd love to hear your your vision of what what this technology and this the creation of digital capital markets could mean for, for your industry. Thanks, Scott. Uh, yeah, I mean, since we got involved with uh, DLA on this project, I. It really has opened my eyes up to the art world in, a, in an unusual way. Um, you know, I still believe the art, art world is about 30, 40 years out of date in terms of technology. And, and this, is, this is a really exciting, uh, revolutionized the art world. I believe it really would be. I mean, certainly to the younger dynamic audiences. I mean, fractional ownership of artwork is Fabulous, I think, is the way forward. I mean, I look at the large two auction houses in the world, and they're they're going into this, and, and I really strongly believe that you know that we're in need of solutions in the art world, and this could be the one. This really could be one the one. And the more I look at this, and the more I understand it, uh, because it's it's slightly new to me, but I'm excited by it. And you've never heard me say that. I'm very excited by it and, uh, you know, just from being an auctioneer and a valuer to actually tokenize something is just extraordinary. So if it captivates me, it's going to captivate the younger audience as well. It will be really interesting to see, won't it, how the market reacts. Um, I mean, one of the things I'm looking for as we, as we push forward into, into this is, you know, value creation apart from, you know, bluntly. So are, are, we going to, are we going to see a situation where a piece of art has a value as a whole, but the fractional parts um, when sold independently is potentially worth more than the whole? And we've seen examples of that in, 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 in early stage real estate projects with the digital yeah. portion of a real estate project has um, certainly appeared to uh, trade at a premium to the, you know, the, the, the traditional world. Uh, and it'll be, it'll be interesting to see if, you know, the fractionalization creates um, a, a value up, uplift um, because of what it means in terms of participation. And, uh, and it'll be interesting with, our, with our, our, our project that hangs behind you there to see what, what happens. And, you know, as, we, as we, we move forward with that potential for a resale of a product that's maybe already tokenized. Yeah. Um, so I'm thinking about, well... We, we, you sort of have to sell, you can sell the individual tokens, but there's also now the possibility to sell that whole piece of art along with a tokenized structure with it. So yeah. here's, here's an artwork, but it's already fractionalized. Would you like the whole thing? Um, so it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how that, how that pans out in the next weeks and months. And certainly the more expensive works of art, you know, yeah. fractional ownership of those makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Uh, you were still looking for a piece of a Van Gogh for me, weren't you? Yeah. <laughs> I still am, <laughs> but but uh, you know I think it would attract a younger, more dynamic audience. Yeah. I mean I've been saying this for eight years in this trade that it's traditionally been a lot of between forty and sixty year olds buying paintings from galleries, auction houses, but the dynamic now is so much younger. It's such a great opportunity for the young crowd. You know the twenty two to 35 year old um, age groups, I think in this could really get excited by this. Mm. Great, thank, thank you. Um, pivot now to Sashila, if I may, and I guess be interested to hear your view on the role of, you know, DLA Piper. We're sitting in the DLA Piper Hong Kong office today. We've been helping to build this uh, Toko product. We've been looking at how we um, support the development of this ecosystem. What, what do you see the role of the, the full service law firm 
uh, in terms of this. Okay, uh, thank you, Scott. So where, where lawyers come, come in is one, we partners with our clients. So first and foremost, at least for DLA, we see ourselves as partners. And because we are partners, we are going to look for legal solutions to business. And this is really a business. So that's one. The full service word you use makes sense because we cover the breadth of practice areas from corporate and regulatory and technology, the field you're in, myself, real estate. So we can then offer a, a solution. Jurisdictionally, you know, when you're doing something like this, you might be crossing jurisdictions. The assets could be one place. Uh, the manager or the, uh, the owner could be another place. The regulatory body, you need to look at many different places because we are jurisdictionally broad. A law firm like ours is, is, you know, lends itself to offering this legal service. There are two elements that people can think of a law firm. One is actually we are boldly innovative, which means we are not looking at law firms as they advise and they give a service today. We are looking at the new, the brave new world we are going into, and we are creating what is actually, you use this word, a secure, safe environment. This has to be an environment that is protective. I use that word as well. Protective for the owner, protective for the investor. And I think we, we do that if we look at how we traditionally protect investors, how we traditionally looked after owners' rights. And now we have to do this in this world with new language. You know, as, as the, the panel speakers are speaking, you know, uh, this language is new to a lot of people. And, yeah. and thankfully, Jonathan, you talked about the younger generation uh, being more familiar with it. And actually, the, the law firm, the lawyer is a fiduciary, first and foremost, looking after the interests of their clients. And that is what we do. Uh, even though it is a brave new world, lots of terminology uh, that people don't understand, actually, it is upon us to make sense of that. Uh, so we see ourselves as, as this, this bridge and the future. Yeah, thanks, Yashio. It's certainly an interesting space. I mean, one of the, one of the um, challenges or, I guess, opportunities I'd like to frame it as that, that I think we've experienced as we've gone through this is that in order to make these projects happen, it requires a real mix of disciplines. Mm. You know, the role of the lawyer, the, the, the prospectus offering documentation, the investor documentation, and all of those pieces that I think are, you know, obviously very familiar to lawyers. Um, but now for them to happen in a way that um, is happening in digital format brings some unique problems. So how do we, how do we get um, the smart contract with the same level of assurance that that you know we have exactly. a, we have an investment document and a, and a traditional contract well how you do that is you get the right people who understand the language who will have to be a hybrid of a lawyer and a technology expert a lawyer and a coder a lawyer and an engineer mm. a lawyer and a scientist and that's how we are hiring mm. we are hiring a mix of people specifically for this and we are in this transition period uh, of, of looking at what lawyers are, are required to do for their clients and one of the things we've done, as you know, Scott, is we've got Aldersgate, which is a company uh, that for us, and you, you know quite a lot about Aldersgate, so we've got this arm which sits alongside our law firm, a subsidiary of our law firm, and they are going to actually uh, codify what is contractual world into a smart contract. And you need a lawyer to do that because they understand how contracts work. They draft them, they're the masters, yeah, their masters of drafting and also consequences of this and this happens then what and what are the legal ramifications of something going wrong so the lawyers know what the courts will say about a particular issue mm. and how you put that into a smart contract is both uh, a technical activity as well as a legal discipline mm. yeah it's a great point because i think the the, the legal drives the smart contract, but the smart contract also feeds back into the into the contract drafting because, you know, smart contracts and indeed computer code by definition are somewhat binary. They need if then type statements the way you just described it. Then, yeah. uh, whereas lawyers have a habit of making reference to concepts like reasonableness, which are very very difficult to code. So there is yeah. actually a need to create investment documents that are codable in the first place. But you can code outcome. Yeah. So you don't need to put sort of wishy-washy terms, but I think the yeah. way in which tokens work is you draft and cater for specific outcomes. And it is our mm. job to say, in these outcomes, these are the commercial solutions. So mm. everybody 
uh, is protected to understand what the commercial solutions are because we know historically what are the solutions for these these issues mm. um, and so I think that's that's where the lawyer uh, can really bridge that gap and then you know for me and, and it's bringing the old world so we talked about this Scott the old world of institution and in, institutional investments the old world of set, uh, centralized registers what lawyers know is how that world works and that world still needs to play a part, okay? This is not about getting rid of the old world and bringing in the new. It is still creating, and I use this word all the time, protective environments for both the owner and the investor. So those are the two ma main players. Mm -hmm. And if you've got managers or third parties coming in, actually they are also playing in this protective environment and nobody is taking advantage of anyone's situation. Mm -hmm. So the lawyer has a fiduciary duty here. Great. Um, enough legal speak, because us two lawyers sitting in a room here will uh, talk all day otherwise. Man, if I could come back to you on the, uh, really on the question of infrastructure and, you know, what do you see as being, you know, needed from a, either an infrastructure establishment or an infrastructure evolution to really support this, uh, you know, this ecosystem from a kind of a tech backbone perspective? Yeah. Well, I mean, if we look at the crypto space in general, it's still a very young space that's not yet gone mainstream. And so just crypto infrastructure is, uh, is not complete and still, uh, well, it's, while it's much better today than it was even five years ago, um, it's still lacking in some ways. It's worse for security tokens. Wallet software, for example, uh, just, there's just no, very little wallet support for security tokens versus normal non-security tokens or utility tokens or you know, other tokens of, of a generic sense. Same thing is true for custodians. Um, there needs to be more custodian, regulated custodian support. Same thing is true for the exchanges themselves. So all of the infrastructure in total needs more support in, in total, especially more support for security tokens in particular and, and then to, to make matters worse, when we're talking about security token offerings, these point products often, if they have licensing, have licensing within a single jurisdiction. And we're talking yeah. about a global uh, yeah. solution where you have tokens flowing cross borders, cross jurisdiction, and then you have the whole regulatory nightmare uh, on top of the, of the technology nightmare that you often have to deal with. So I, you know, I, I think that, um, the, there's a lot of excitement, certainly, around the notion of security tokens and the uh, ability to get liquidity out of uh, 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 assets that are historically difficult to get liquidity out of. Certainly, no thought previously of fractionalizing. So there, there's a, and the opportunity is huge. And so there are lots of, of organizations and people that are working to solve these problems. Of course, DLA Piper is a prime example. Um, so the, the market is maturing, but it's still in its very you know, infancy. And uh, that represents opportunity, frankly, opportunity for entrepreneurs, opportunity, opportunity for organizations that have infrastructure or are already in related businesses that can uh, sort of uh, chart the path and take advantage of uh, being the, the early mover, the first mover and, and reaping the rewards. So it's an exciting time for the industry in general. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks very much, Mance. I, I absolutely agree. It's an integration challenge um, legally and technically um, is how I would you know, respond to that. I mean, legally, you're right. We have regulations and regulatory frameworks that differ country by country and we have an asset class that wants to behave like a cryptocurrency with no regard for um, national boundaries and regulatory regimes. And it's, it's the combination of that, the reality of that, of that technology and the, the domestic nature of regulation that's a problem. But then the, the other piece is that technology integration. So while our TOCO engine is somewhat agnostic in terms of the, the tokens and where it can spit tokens out, it's using you know, a combination of the Hedera platform and the hyperledger you know in its core engine but it is then able to draft you know write smart contracts to deploy onto different platforms so we can produce tokens of many shapes and sizes and flavors and deploy them onto different um, platforms but how do the ecosystem players handle that 
who, who, who can hold a Hedera native token today from, from a, an issuance, from a digital distribution perspective, from a custody perspective, how many digital asset exchanges can, can hold that? And that's not just a Hedera problem. This is a problem with uh, many aspects of security tokens. And I think that the reality of what we've been finding in those integration discussions is that the, 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 the revenue has still been sitting in unregulated assets in cryptocurrencies largely, and therefore the ecosystem has built the integration around cryptocurrencies, broadly speaking not security tokens. So that, that will need to evolve. And we're certainly, along with yourselves and others, working hard to, uh, to do that integration piece. Um, with that in mind, Gary, can I come back to you? I mean, what do you, you know, there's some of the hurdles I see uh, as well, but what do you see uh, are, are the current hurdles for, you know, the, the would-be issuers as they, as they start trying to tap into these um, digital capital markets going forward? Sure. I, um, I would uh, very much echo what Mance has, uh, has uh, just described as sort of the shortfall of the of sort of the current uh, di digital asset ecosystem. Um, I, I think that 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 shortfall is sort of multifaceted, um, and I, I guess from our perspective, OSL, you know, we, we we are a first and foremost a trading platform. We are a marketplace, and OSL digital securities, as and when it becomes licensed in Hong Kong is effectively going to be very similar to a lot of the traditional broker dealers, um, as well as marketplaces uh, in, in traditional capital markets. We are in the business of facilitating dealing. And that means what, uh, what, what we see as critical for the growth of the STO business are traders. And traders need certain things, need, need to see certain attributes in order for them to, in, in order for them to, to you know to actually make a living from trading so I, I think that sort of just to sidestep a little bit what, what, um, there are things that I think I think uh, certainly within this forum I think we're all broadly in agreement with and and I think uh, even Ashley older earlier uh, I think last week Hong Kong uh, fintech week um, uh, echoed a sentiment which is digital assets are here to stay we certainly certainly um, agree with that 100 percent. Um, but I think, you know, we also need to ask ourselves, you know, what, what else are here to stay? And the answer to that is, I, I think, certainly in the short term, um, all of those trusted parts of the ecosystem that, we, that we're used to dealing with, like banking, regulated intermediaries and financial discipline. And I think discipline was, was a word that, that, that I think we, we, we also mentioned a little bit earlier on. And, and, and the way I would, I would look at that is it, it's sort of like the age old question. And just because you can doesn't mean you should and and sort of you know when you when we look at sort of the the sto um uh ecosystem or universe that that, that you know that, that hopefully we're going to see it we're going to see a growth in um you know we, we we need to look at this as you know being able to meaningfully ask and answer that question is, is really you know one of the hallmarks of mature financial financial ecosystem and really, I mean, what we're talking about, as I, as I alluded to earlier on, STO, we are really talking about financial instruments and financial products. And decisions regarding buying and selling and trading STOs really are, first and foremost, financial decisions. So, so STOs as a medium will not turn a bad financial product into a good one. Um, I think, you know, we, we, we would all sort of broadly accept that. Uh, but uh, by, the, by the same token, um, it, 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 as a medium, it can, it, it can really, or, or it certainly has the potential to give some very uh, interesting additional features to good, to good products um, that can potentially make them more accessible, more tradable, and in time, um, and I say in time cautiously, uh, in time more liquid and even better investments. So, 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 so I think just to, just to sort of come back, come back a little bit back into, into the core question of what, what are the key hurdles? Um, and and th this is the point that, that I think I think we've sort of variously, uh, you know, at, at different points in time touched on, you know, what are the areas where we think um, um, the ecosystem or, or the digital asset uh, uh, ecosystem needs to evolve a little bit more before, you know, be, before we can we can really see the, the full potential of STOs uh, coming to fruition. Um, the, these, the, these will be things that, that, that I see sort of in two categories. Um, um, you know, obvi obviously, on the one hand, we've got hard infrastructure. Um, these are these are things like technology, legal structures, and even trading platforms. These, honestly, in my in, uh, personally, I would I would say we are probably doing pretty well. 
Um, you know, th there's no shortage of technologists. There's no shortage of, of lawyers like yourselves, you know, who are extremely competent in the space, who can, who can come up with legal structures that will work. But on the other hand, soft infrastructure um, is, is the, the, the thing that uh, I would be more interested in. You know, the, these are the things that we don't think about, but they're, but, but they're the things that sort of make our lives a little bit easier, a little, little bit better behind the scenes. So things like for all the professional advisors, whether they're lawyers, accountants, uh, trusted intermediaries. Um, so Mans had, had uh, earlier mentioned custodians. Um, you know, we, we, we usually don't spend a lot of time to think about them, but without them, um, you know, even a very good investment can potentially just be zero. You know, without, without being able to mitigate counterparty risk, uh, good investments mean nothing. Um, and being able to connect with banks and traders. Um, and, and I think all the other stuff that we, we, we also usually don't think about, but actually uh, really do make trading experience uh, better are things like all the compliance tools, all the AML tools, uh, all, all, all the tools that keep markets clean. Um, and also it's sort of, you know, really boring, but we need them, all the settlement departments, all the operations departments, all the tax, tax advisors who make sure we pay the right taxes when we make some money. So these are all the things that will make, um, as I said earlier on, for, from a trader perspective and from a marketplace perspective, without those elements, uh, tra traders uh, would probably have a hard time uh, really making those sorts of markets liquid for, for everyone's benefit. And last of all, regulators as well. And, and, this, is, and, and this is a point that, uh, you know, once again, um, you know, th this may not, maybe this doesn't fall into the category of soft infrastructure, but, but th this is also the, the sort of thing that gives traders comfort when they're trading in an asset to not have to worry about whether they're breaking the law. So that, that's, that's how I would probably sort of cover the, the, the picture. Yeah, it's great insight. Thanks, Thanks very much, um, Gary. Um, you point to you know some of the some of the opportunities um, you know whether it's liquidity or dynamic new markets and products and I'll maybe I'll, I'll maybe turn to to John and then to Sheila in turn but John in terms of you know the art um, the art space um, and you know we, we had an interesting conversation as we sourced that painting behind you uh, with with the artist himself. Uh, translated through several languages, and um, uh, I, I, you know it was, it was quite interesting. But I, I, you know, from there are different layers of the ecosystem. So you have artists, you have yourself, you know, sitting as a uh, an auction house and, and an art dealer. Then yeah. you have investors. You know, do you what, what do you see in terms? I mean, has there been any feedback from different layers there that you can share, whether it's from the artists? Uh, or... I think the art art world is all about provenance. It's all about um, a very straight shooting uh, business, if you see what I mean. The you know there's there's always a, a grey area within the art world uh, alleged, but this enables provenance to be di digitalized. Everything's becoming very clear and neat, and I think this could be the winner uh, in terms of attracting, as I said earlier, and Sheila backed it up really on the younger crowd. Uh, it's something we really, really are focusing on in this company, let mm -hmm. alone uh, doing this. But yeah, I see it. I, I, I see there's a few hurdles to get over, but the provenance of the artworks, the valuations of the artworks, it's the bid price to buy it in the first place. But in, in, in essence, you know, I look around the office, talk to the other artists we deal with, they're, they're curious. This, this is opening their eyes a little bit in China. So it's quite fun. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it'd be fascinating to see how that plays out. Hopefully we start a stir with this uh, first project. And, and, and so Sheila, um, you know, in terms of real estate, I, I think by most measures, it's one of, if not the largest asset class in the world. Um, it, it's obviously something that vast numbers of, people are involved in either personally or from an investment perspective. Um, you know, how do you view this security token offering from an issuance and the, and the secondary market? How do, you, how do you see the possibilities for the use of this technology and these new structures to really fundamentally alter uh, the traditional real estate market? So, I mean, real estate is, you know, very much 
an investment and has been so for the longest time. You know, people invest in real estate, either owning it themselves, owning companies that own it, co-owning it, buying on the listed space, uh, buying REITs. So uh, people are familiar with, with, with owning real estate and it is a very difficult to own real estate because it's a higher cost of entry. Mm. It's an expensive asset class. Especially here in Hong Kong. Especially here in Hong Kong. Um, and so it, uh, in theory, it's, 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 it's also a hedge to the stock market. Sometimes you, you buy real estate um, because you wanna have you know, assets on the ground, et cetera. So all good reasons, what I think is happening today is, and we, we've alluded to it already, it's the shared economy that we are now in. We are, we are sharing everything. We are sharing the way we, we occupy hotels. We're sharing the way we uh, use our delivery companies. We are sharing office space. So that shared ownership uh, for real estate, we sort of share it in the list of space, but that is a, a one, one way of entry. It's a regulated space, which is also fine, and that's how it's it's done, but what tokenization does is it gives an opportunity to uh, potentially with, so uh, Gary, I completely agree with you, your soft infrastructure, I've written it down, and I'm going to use that term, because part of the soft infrastructure you're talking about gives access to ultimately the investor. It's creating that safe environment for that investor. So with real estate, absolutely, people do want a piece of the pie, and actually all stats prove that People are looking for shared ownership. The leases is a kind of shared occupancy, but it's a new way of owning. That's what this is for real estate. But for this to happen, and, and as I, I listen to everybody who's got a part to play here, a few things has to occur. And I, I like things in three, uh, Scott, as you know. I do know this. I, I, I'm going to call it the SES, okay? Um, first, it needs to be safe and secure. It needs to be uh, compliant with regulations, you know, and, and we are trying to do that and working with various people here. It needs to be transparent, where before real estate was, was held either by various centralized registers. I don't think you can get rid of it completely. There is no need to. You need to find a way to work more efficiently with it. Um, the, the, the blockchain technology, whether it's the hash graph or the blockchain, is a way in which to record your interest, not directly in the asset, but at least in the entity that owns the asset. So it needs to be safe. The second thing is it needs to be easy. Everything we are talking about today is trying to make it easy for investors, whether it's the soft infrastructure, whether it is the ease of tracking your ownership through the custodian, whether it is you know, easy to trade on your phone to access valuation information. We are trying to build this uh, in an easy way. So it needs to be easy uh, for, and for real estate. It has been hard. Yeah. Uh, so what, what this can do, if we get this right, is it needs to be easy and it needs to be agile. So you can't, you need a marketplace. It can't just be for a small group of people, although we agree you're developing that marketplace and we need lots of professionals to help us do that. And the last thing is, it's not just about real estate, anything that can be commonly owned and shared, whether it is art, whether it's real estate, whether it is a revenue in a, in a performance of, a, of an artist, whether it is insurance risk, anything that you want to share the risk, share the ownership that is income producing, maybe not even not, maybe something you can enjoy, can be tokenized. And therein lies the beauty of this concept. So it is about real estate, the area which I'm, I'm in, but actually as you delve into it, in this shared economy, actually it is open to a lot more other assets. Mm. Yeah, great. And maybe on that point, I'll just, as a last question, throw back to you, man. So, I mean, the, the rest of the panel here is, I think we're all, we're all sitting in, in Hong Kong. Um, and we're actually in Hong Kong due to current circumstances rather than travelling as we might normally be. Uh, but from your perspective, man, I mean, what are you seeing in terms of asset classes? So Sheila's touched on a few, and obviously we've discussed real estate and art, but particularly with the US, um, you know, perspective, given your base there, uh, what, what sort of assets are you hearing people talking about? Well, of course, we hear about the same assets that we've talked about here, artwork, collectibles, commercial real estate, et cetera. Having said that, we, we've also heard uh, some assets that are maybe would be considered new in some sense. Um, Spencer Dinwiddie, an NBA player here in the United States, is building a platform that its intended purpose is to make it possible 
for accredited investors in this case to own shares of a revenue stream in celebrities or sports uh, players, you know, athletes, uh, creators in a general sense. And Spencer views this as something more than just selling a security token to, to a revenue stream. He views it as a new way of engaging with the fan base. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's so he's, he, it's a new model in, in some sense. Well, it's, it's, the same, it's the same, it's an old model in the sense that people are investing in, in a particular revenue stream. It's new in its engagement model. Mm-hmm. And that is made possible by the promise of, uh, of the, the tokens and the ability to trade those tokens in a very fluid, uh, easy way and, and to tokenize assets or to provide liquidity, uh, liquidity into assets that would otherwise be hard to provide liquidity into. So I would c- consider that the bleeding edge. And uh, you know sometimes there's a, a good reason that it's called the bleeding edge. Uh, <laughs> but but uh, you know I think it's fascinating to watch what's going on and uh, especially here in this case with Spencer. That's a, it's an extraordinary uh, use case and I have I have heard you talk about it before and uh, um, it's got me thinking about you know whether it's sports stars or, or other, other people with significant revenue streams and a fan base that connects to it um, that, that really does. And, and I think to me, it's an example of the exciting opportunity that this ecosystem creates. I mean, I'm, a, I'm actually a, a technology and contracts lawyer and the ability to do things in contract is pretty unrestrained, unlike some of the regulator, once you're down at sort of real estate regulatory, you know, sitting on land registry, there are, there are, there are a lot of rules and constraints, but the beauty of once you're up at the sort of tokenomics, um, economic interest within a token layer is that you're at contract law and contracts are with a few, you know, minor exceptions, extremely flexible things. And it really is the art of the possible. So conscious of uh, timing, we are, we are now up. I just want to uh, thank all of you for uh, participating in this really interesting panel. Look, looking forward to working w- with all of you and others as we continue to build out this ecosystem. So. Um, thank you very much, Gary, Mance, John, and, and Sashila. I uh, look forward to seeing you over the course of the rest of the conference on various breakouts and uh, working with you soon. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. Thank you.